Hey, today we're wrapping up the series that we've called Love Stories. We've been looking at these Old Testament couples, kind of the good, the bad, the ugly, and saying, what can we learn from them? And so we kicked off the series. Look at the story of Ruth and Boaz. And uh, we discovered how, how really Boaz becomes this picture of Jesus. And just as he was Ruth's kinsman, redeemer, Jesus is ours. And then we looked at the story of Abraham and Sarah. And we talked about how even though Abraham was a great guy, and even though he was the most blessed person in the Old Testament, more, most respected person in human history, and that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all think Abraham's great, when it came down to it, he had some giant blind spots when it came to being a husband. And so we learned no such thing as a perfect marriage, but that our marriages can still be beautiful, and that they can still be pictures of God's love for us. And then last week, we looked at the story of Isaac and Rebecca, and we talked about this whole thing of oneness, unity in our marriage, and how they had this division in their marriage that then affected their family for decades. And so we talked about this kind of wonder of two becoming one and how in doing so it's this picture of God's love for us and our oneness with Jesus. And so today we're going to look at the final one of these stories. It's going to be the weirdest love story that we've looked at. It's probably the weirdest love story that you've ever heard. And so if you have your Bibles, go over to Hosea chapter 1. People do seem to cheer more loudly when I say it's a super weird story. <laughs> Something's wrong with you guys. Um, Hosea chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. The word Hosea is this prophet. The word Hosea literally means salvation. It says, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So that gives us this historical context, that it's this moment where Israel's been split into two kingdoms, the, uh, the northern and the southern kingdom. And uh, so we know that Hosea was a contemporary of other prophets like Isaiah or Amos. And so Israel at this moment, it's in this big mess. There, there's not peace in the land. The people have wandered from worshiping the one true God and things are a big, big mess. And so that's where we can pick up in the story in verse two. It says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, and we're going to actually read it. I'm going to read it from this uh, screen here in the NIV. It says, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman. Other translations, if you're following along in the ESV, it says, uh, go and marry a prostitute. Is actually what other, some other translations say. Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. When then he tells his wife, he says, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And, and so it's this fascinating story where God goes to his prophet who, who, uh, and says, hey, I want you to marry uh, a, either a promiscuous woman or, or some translations say prostitute. And so imagine, just kind of just to put it in perspective, imagine the scandal, like before Billy Graham got married, right? And so Billy Graham, single preacher, preacher man, and God says, hey, I want you to go marry a prostitute or someone that is so promiscuous, everyone thinks she's a prostitute. Can you, I mean, you look at, you guys look startled even now and, and like, oh my gosh, don't talk about Billy that way. And so, uh, <laughs> and, and so, uh, but here we see, that's what God says to this, this prophet, the prophet of the nation of Israel says, go and, and marry this promiscuous woman. And, and so what we see is this thing where, where, uh, what God is going to do with Hosea is he is doing this unique thing where he says, I, you're not just going to bring this prophetic message for me to my people. I'm asking you to actually illustrate it with your own life. And he says, you go and marry a promiscuous woman because Israel, his, God's covenant people, have been unfaithful to me. And, and so that's how the story begins. And then they have three kids, the way it reads. Most scholars believe that one of those kids, that Hosea was actually the baby daddy, and two, uh, Hosea was not. And then these kids get these weird names which mean uh, things that have to do with, with God speaking of how his people have, have wandered away and kind of how, how they've chosen to not be his people. And so that's kind of how chapter one goes. And then chapter two, we see that God's just making it real clear. Hey, this, this, the, the, your life story of you marrying Gomer, by the way, Gomer, if anyone is looking for a name for a daughter, it's a thing, you know, it's uh, Oh, he says, you marrying Gomer, this promiscuous woman, is, uh, is going to be uh, a, a living illustration 
of how Israel ha has been unfaithful to me. A and so that's where we kind of see in chapter 2, just a kind of a couple of highlights just to give us the perspective. He says, say to your brothers, you are my people and to your sisters, you have received mercy. And so we see a little bit of kind of this cryptic, crypt, cryptic language there, referencing back to those weird names of those three kids, where are kind of these names that, that are kind of speaking about how they have, they've left being the people of God. They've chosen to walk away from their covenant with God. And so in, in those names, they, one of them means you're not my people. One of them means you've not received mercy, as, as he says. But so in, in this beginning of this message, we say, hey, God's saying, hey, you are my people and your sisters you have received mercy it's, it's saying god hasn't given up on his people skip down to verse 7 and talking about kind of israel's unfaithfulness she shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them and she shall seek them but shall not find them then she shall say i will go and return to my here's what this kind of is talking about here it's that when we Per, to choose to pursue and worship anything other than the one true God, we always find ourselves want, left wanting. It never really satisfies. And so he's saying Israel and, and this kind of covenant relationship between God and Israel, which God describes as like a marriage, which is this kind of picture that we see kind of reinforced in the New Testament about, about how God and his people are this kind of marriage relationship. The church is called the bride of Christ. And he says, hey, you've chosen to be unfaithful and go and pursue other lovers. He says, but what you do is you, you find that you're, it's never, you're really never satisfied in that is kind of what this saying is here. So, so he says, there was a moment where you're going to come to your senses. He says, and I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. He says, you're going to come back to me. And then God says, hey, you've lost sight of the fact that, that, uh, of how good I've been to you, verse 8. He says, she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold. He says, I have blessed the nation Israel, but they, in spite of my blessing, they've chosen to go and worship other gods, he says. He says, they used the things I gave them to go and worship other gods. He says, therefore, I will take back my grain and its time and my wine. He says, discipline is coming. But then we skip down here to verse 14. God is saying, God's saying, this is my heart towards you, that this story would end with you coming back to me and us having this great relationship. He says, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the, he says, I, I'm going to bring blessing. And then uh, look at verse 16. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. That word Baal, it's a, it's a t name that we see regularly of kind of speaking of these false gods, these idols. And so we kind of see kind of this um, kind of word play here. He says, you'll, you'll no longer, you call me your husband, not no longer my Baal. Maybe your translation says my master. He said, and, and what we kind of, the idea that we see here is that these, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but they have kind of gotten so confused. It's like they don't really know when they're worshiping the one true God or where they've kind of fallen over and, to wor and, and are worshiping these false gods. And so God's like, hey, sometimes you mess up and call me the name of your idol. And, and so we will unpack that more in a bit, in a little bit. He says, I'll remove the names of the veils from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. And then we, we kind of skip down and we see uh, um, verse 20, uh, verse 19, and I will betroth you to me forever. But before that, he talks about this blessing that's going to come, this peace that's going to come. He says, and I'll betroth you to me forever, and I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. God's saying, hey, you're, you're going to come back to me, and then our relationship will be restored forever. I will, will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And then skipping down. Verse 23, and it says, and I will have mercy on no mercy. You've got to have to go back and look at those names of those three kids that all kind of speak of kind of their distance between them and God. He's saying, hey, I'll, I'm going to bring mercy back. You're going to be my people, and you will say, you are my God. And so what God is saying to Hosea is he's saying, you are going to be this living illustration of my love for the nation of Israel who has, who has been unfaithful to me. And so God says, just like in a marriage where one person in the marriage can choose to be unfaithful, he says, that's what the people of Israel have done. And then now we see in chapter 3, we go back to the life of Hosea, and it gets even weirder. Here it goes. Listen, if the Bible was a movie that wasn't edited, it would be an X-rated movie. Don't go and make the movie. It'd be super weird. 
It says, and the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who was loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Kind of, kind of this imagery, speaking of the things of the world and speaking of things having to do with idol worship. He says, uh, so God says, hey, so, so, so he initially he starts off the story. He says, Hosea, you're going to marry Gomer, and, and she is a, a promiscuous woman. She's thought of as being a prostitute even. And so he says, uh, and so now they get married, and then, and then what we, the, kind of the idea we're getting painted here is that Gomer has cheated on Hosea, has cheated on Hosea kind of repeatedly, has now chosen to leave Hosea. And now is in where the, kind of the, where the scene catches up here in a moment is, uh, is she's about to be sold off as a sex slave at auction is kind of the, I told you it was going to get weird. I didn't write this stuff, right? <laughs> Don't blame me. Um, and so, uh, here, so that's where we catch up. And so God says, go and find her. She's left you. She's gone and been with other man after other man after other man after other man. You go find her. And so now Hosea finds her at this auction, and he says, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethage of barley. And so basically we get this idea. The going rate for a slave in, in this time was about 30 shekels of silver. And, and so, but because Hosea was a poor preacher man, it looks like what he had to his name was these 15 shekels of sil silver and a bunch of grain. And so he's like showing up with like everything he's got at this auction. He's going all in. And he says, and I said, and so he purchases her at auction. And then he says, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So I, those of you that brought your small children into service this morning are like, if I knew that he was going to read verses that said whore, I wouldn't have brought them in. That's why we have the great children's ministry at Life Church. And so, uh, <laughs> Daddy, what's a whore? I don't know. Um, and so, um, so uh, again, I don't write this stuff, right? He says, so, I will, and so, so will I also be to you, right? So, um, He's like, I'm going to go get my kid and bring him into service. And so uh, the kid needs to toughen up anyway. And so uh, I'm bringing him in. Um, so um, so big picture, what do we see in the story? Big picture is what we see. In Gomer, in the person of Gomer, we see ourselves for who we really are that we are far more broken than we could ever imagine. So in this story, Gomer is a picture of Israel. And Israel is a picture of us. And so what we see in Gomer is that we're far more broken than we could ever imagine. I think a lot of times, maybe if you grew up like me, maybe grew up in a, in a maybe grew up in the church, maybe uh, grew up in a pretty stable home, never did anything super, super, super crazy, um, that you might, we might look at ourselves and say, you know what, I'm, I'm a pretty good person and I've got a, little, got a little bit of sin and a little bit of brokenness and I'm thankful that Jesus makes the difference in for that maybe, like, hey, I'm 80% there, I'm thankful that Jesus makes up that final 20%. And the overall teaching of scripture and what we see in this story is this idea that, that we are all a whole lot more broken than we might realize and that we're far more broken than we can possibly imagine. And so well, the story here is, is painted as, as, as like God's painting this picture of the most broken relationship imaginable, where, where you have the most intimate relationship imaginable between a husband and a wife, and then one of the partners just kind of cheats over and over and over and over and over again, ultimately just sells themselves in, in, into sex slavery. It, it's like this, and, and, and so it's like this idea that that our relationship with God apart from Christ is more broken than we could possibly imagine. And so we see some, some things about ourselves and, and both Gomer and the children of Israel. One thing we see is that we can be inconsistent. And that one day Gomer was committing herself to Hosea and, the next, and then very soon after she's in bed with someone else and then someone else and then someone else. And so it's a picture of the children of Israel and their inconsistency. Hosea 6, 4 uh, says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. 
And so God's saying, hey, just a He says, just like when you wake up in the morning and there's dew on the grass and a few hours later it's gone. He says, man, that's how you guys are with your relationship with me. Where one day you're saying, I love you and I'm all in. And and then later in that day, so it could even be just later same day in the morning. In the morning you're saying, I'm all in. And by afternoon you've you've kind of totally left the reservation and now you're worshiping other gods. It's this thing where we can be inconsistent. We're, we're maybe from, from day to day, maybe Sundays, man, you're all in on Jesus. And then by, by Tuesday, you're, you're totally pursuing other things that don't really matter. And, 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 or even it could be like even from, in, from morning to afternoon. Like in the morning, you're having this great quiet time and you're, you're praying and you're reading the word. And then you're like even just driving to work, right? And someone cuts you off and you don't think about shooting the bird, you're imagining shooting a rocket at that car, right? Like, you're, you're like, oh man, I just, anyone else have, like, wish your car had, like, rocket launchers? Is that, anybody else as depraved as me, right? And so, it's like, you know, and so, man, a couple hours ago, man, you're all just all in on Jesus, and now you're filled with rage. Or early in the morning, you're all in with Jesus, the afternoon, you're flirting with your secretary, looking at stuff on your computer you shouldn't be looking at. He says, man, there's this inconsistency. You're, you're, you're kind of, and so we see that in, in Gomer, we see it in the people of Israel, we see in ourselves that we can, that we're prone to wonder. I, I like the old, uh, the old song, Come Thou Fount of Many Blessings. It says, uh, part of it says, prone, to, it says, oh to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, that word fetter, it, it, imagine like um, handcuffs for your feet, like, like if your feet are chained to something. He says, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Saying, God, help me not to wander. God, God, so so connect me to your goodness that I don't wander away. He says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The writer of that song is saying, God, I know myself, and I know that from day to day, from hour to hour, there's moments I'm all in, and then there's moments where I just begin to wander away and want to take control of my life and do my own thing, and there's this inconsistency thing. The same, something we see in, in the tour of Israel is, is that we want to mix worshiping God with worshiping other stuff. We, we see it here that... Uh, uh, part of what was going on here is, is the, there's kind of this idol worship that had kind of crept in, and, um, and, and there's kind of all this kind of ritual stuff, weirdness, and, and so, so when, it's, when he says, hey, you, don't, you no longer call me Baal, kind of the idea is that, man, you've lost sight of who you're even worshiping. Like one, you're, you're kind of mixed, so mixed, your worship of me with your worship of these false gods, you can't even tell the difference. And here's the truth. I really believe the religion of the day in America is what's called syncretism. It's a fancy word where it just means we're going to kind of mix together a bunch of stuff and call it religion. And so it's like we're going to take a little bit of Jesus and then a little bit of Eastern religion and a little bit of Oprah, (laughs) a little bit of America worship, and kind of mix it together as if it's all one thing. A little bit of the American dream. And we kind of think that it's all one thing. And he's like, man, you guys have lost sight. You don't even know who you're worshiping. You're calling me the wrong name sometimes. He's like, you've kind of just mixed it all together. You think it's all about me, but really you've mixed all this other stuff in there. And and the same thing happens with us as as we want to mix worshiping God with mix it with with other stuff, whether whether it's the pursuit of money, the pursuit of things, the pursuit of comfort, that there's these other things that, that begin to take primary roles in our life when it comes to the things that are our mind's attention and our heart's affection. These are the things that, that we think it's all about and, and we kind of think that we can kind of mix it all together and call it Jesus. We want to mix worshiping God with worshiping other stuff. We do it because we lose sight of the goodness of God. And in Hosea 2, he says, hey, man, you've lost sight that I'm the one that gave you all this grain. 
Man, you, you, you've had to tried to pursue all these other gods. You've lost sight that I'm the one that, that gave you those crops and gave you that grain. Later on, he says, man, I'm the one that delivered you out of Egypt. I'm the one that sets you free. And they've lost sight of the goodness of God. And they think, hey, man, if I only go after God, I'm going to be missing out on something. And so I'm going to kind of mix in this other stuff, worship these other things that lose sight of the goodness of God. And so what God's big message is to Israel here is he's saying, hey, you guys, Men have committed adultery. Man, you've committed spiritual adultery when you go after these other things and worship these other things. He says, man, you've, it's like you've committed spiritual adultery. And so Hosea, man, what you're going to do is, is your life's going to be this kind of picture of this, this living illustration. And, and, and I think that we can all fall into that. We, we, we kind of want to have it our own way. And we want to, we kind of reject God's covenant relationship with us in pursuit of these one night stands and these other areas of our lives. And so there's this kind of adultery that takes place. And so in, and, and Gomer, we see that we're all far more broken than we realize. In Hosea, we see God for who he really is, that he loves us more than we could ever imagine. In this story, this story is a big picture of God. And Hosea, his name is Salvation, and, and God uses this imagery of this most intimate relationship between a, a husband and wife. It's God, a husband and wife. It's God saying, that's the relationship that I want to have with my people. And, and so here's some things we see about God in this story. God, Hosea chooses to love Gomer knowing who she was. God does the same knowing fully who we are. Here's the thing. Man, God comes, comes to Hosea and says, hey, marry the promiscuous woman, marry the prostitute. He, he says, hey, he doesn't come and say, hey, marry that woman that 10 years ago was promiscuous. He doesn't say, hey, marry that, that woman who, who 10 years ago was a prostitute, but now she's gotten her life all together. He comes and says, hey, marry the promiscuous woman. Marry the prostitute. Hosea knew exactly what he was signing up for. That Gomer, Gomer just did the stuff that Gomer had always done. And so Hosea knew what he was getting into, and he still chose to love her. And here's the good news. There's nothing that you've ever done that God was surprised by. You've never blown it in such a way that God was like, wow, that totally shocks me. I never saw that in him. <laughs> he, there's nothing you could ever do that would shock him. He signed up for loving you. Knowing exactly who you are, knowing that you're going to blow it from time to time, knowing that there's going to be moments where you're not going to be faithful, knowing that there's going to be moments where you're prone to wonder, and he signed up to love you anyway. And it's the same thing that Hosea did. He knew what he was getting into, and he still said, I'm going to love her. And, and God knew what he was getting into with you, and he said, I'm going to love him anyway. The love of God is, so we were song, saying in the song earlier about the reckless love of God. It's this way man, that God, even though it didn't make any sense, goes all in on us. It's really it, it, what we see here with Hosea and Gomer. It's this kind of scandalous kind of love. And it's God saying, hey, I love you with this scandalous kind of love. Hosea pursues Gomer. And God pursues us when we wonder. So uh, Gomer's cheated most likely time after time after time. Now she kind of leaves, goes her own, does her own thing. And God says, hey, I want you to go and find her. Hosea goes and pursues Gomer. And the same is true with you. Listen, if you've not yet come to a spot where, where, where you've given your life to Christ, where you've recognized how much God loves you, but because I'm broken and you're broken, I'm sinful, you're sinful, we all find ourselves separated from God. And that's why God came to earth as a man, born as a little baby, so that he might grow up and die in my place and die in your place and rise from the dead. If that's never become personal for you, where you've trusted in what Jesus did on the cross to save you, and, and, and really given Jesus the steering wheel of your life, if you've never done that, then I believe believe God is pursuing you even now. I believe you even being here today is a part of God pursuing you, chasing you. It's the same thing we see that Hosea does with Gomer. But here's the thing. If you've already given your life to Christ, if you're already a follower of Jesus, I still believe God is pursuing you. And those moments when we are prone to wonder, and those moments of inconsistency, of those moments when we begin to, to make life about things it's not really about, and then and doing so kind of worshiping these false gods, when we in doing so, I, I, I believe God is pursuing us in those moments. And so just like Hosea pursued Gomer, God is pursuing you. 
Hosea remains faithful even when Gomer did not. Man, Hosea and Gomer both took the same vows. They both said, hey, I'm going to be faithful. Till death do us part, I'm all in. And one person kept the vows and one person didn't. But the fact that Gomer didn't keep the vows didn't keep Hosea from being faithful. And the same thing is true with God. That, that, he, that 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful faithful. And, and so that God is faithful. The, the story of Hosea and Gomer reminds us that God loves us, not because of our faithfulness, but because of his. Here's the last thing and we're done. No, nope, second to the last thing and then we're done. Hosea was shamed in his love for Gomer. You can imagine this. So God says to Hosea, I want you to go and find her. So Hosea goes down to the bad part of town. And he goes and he says, hey, man, I'm looking for my wife, Gomer. Has anybody seen her? And this guy's like, hey, man, I've seen her. And, I mean, I didn't know you guys were still together. And I'm sorry. And I saw her with that guy. And I saw her with, a couple of weeks ago with those two guys. And I saw her leaving with that guy the other day. And go to the other guys, hey, have you guys seen, you guys seen Gomer? And they're saying, yeah, I saw her. Saw her. I, think she's, I think she's over there in this other part of town. I saw her going with this guy a couple weeks ago, and I heard she was with this guy. And then he goes, he asks, he says, man, have you seen Gomer? I'm looking for my wife. And he's like, oh, I, I saw her. Man, I'm sorry. And then can you imagine Hosea walking away and those two guys at the end of that street corner talking, saying, man, what an idiot. Man, why doesn't he kick her to the curb? knowing that she's been with guy after guy after guy after guy. And then here's this guy still just chasing after her. And, 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 and you'd say, well, what an idiot. Why doesn't he just move on? What, what's he doing going after her? Can you imagine what an idiot Hosea must have felt like just walking around the bad part of town saying, man, has anybody seen my wife? Oh, it sounds like everybody's seen my wife. But, and then kind of this, this, and, but I still love her. But I still want to take her back and then he and it's this incredible shame and it's this picture that in the gospel the god of the universe left all the wonders and glories of heaven to come and be born as a powerless baby who, who would then be laid in a trough where animals ate out of. And that story begins with shame, but it ends with greater shame. We're, we're now the God of the universe, taken on the flesh of, of, of man, is now hung on a cross naked, allowing soldiers that he himself created to hammer nine-inch nails in his hands, even though he could have called all the angels of heaven to, to deliver him from that. He endured the shame of hanging naked on a cross, taking the sins and the shame and the guilt of the world upon himself. That story, it begins with shame and it ends with shame. This, this, that, that just as Hosea and his pursuit of Gomer embrace this shame, it's this picture of God and his pursuit of us, embracing the shame. Hosea purchased that which already belonged to him. And in doing so, everything changed for Gomer. And really, that's the gospel. Go over to 1 Corinthians. Let me show this to you. I'm going to show you two little passages from the same chapter. Hosea 6, verse 9. It says, For you do not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, anyone that's ever put anything before God, idolater, nor adulterers, Jesus, anyone that's ever thought of lustful thoughts and adulterer in their heart. Nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It's pretty intense. But I love that next few words there here. And Paul says, and such were some of you. You know, I kind of imagine Paul writing this letter, and he's kind of, he's writing it. And I kind of imagine the first draft, Paul writes, and such were all of you. And then I, I think he's thinking, oh, yeah, man, yeah, they were, yeah, they were definitely lustful and adulterers, and they were for sure greedy. And, man, I've I seen that guy drunk. 
They were drunkards. That's how they used to be. He says, but now, and he's, and he's kind of writing, he's like, and that's how all of you guys were as far as I remember. And then he remembers there's this sweet little girl that just gave her life to Jesus a couple of weeks ago, like eight years old. He's like, oh, oh yeah, Sally. I guess we'll say in such were some of you. Because, I, I, man, if I've been in church my whole life, pretty much everyone I've ever known, man, at some point did some of this stuff. Right? Or are you guys the good folks? You guys the good ones? No, I know most of y'all. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> He says, and that's how you guys were. You guys were all that stuff. But Jesus made the difference. He says, but you were washed. You're not that guy anymore. You were sanctified. You're becoming, you've been made like Jesus. You were justified just as if you'd never sinned. And the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. But then skip over to the last part of this chapter. Let me show this to you. Verse 19. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't belong to you. Why? For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I just imagine that Hosea, he's asked everybody around, man, where, where's Gomer? Where's Gomer? Where's Gomer? And, and they finally say, hey, man, I, I, I heard that she was going to be auctioned off over where they do that. And then he shows up at that auction, and, and uh, Gomer's up on the platform where the auctioneer's about to auction her off, and he says, hey, excuse me, hey, uh, man, that's my wife up there, and we're married. She should be with me, and then that auctioneer says, man, I don't care who you say you are, and I don't care who you say she is to you, we're about to auction her off. And then he says, well, man, I'll... I'm, I'm going to go all in with all I got. I've got this, I got 15 shekels of, of silver and I got this grain and I got this other thing and I'm all in. And, and, and what we see here is that, is that Hosea purchases the thing that already belongs to him. And in doing so, we see this picture of the gospel. And, and that even though God made you and God made me and by all rights we belong to him. Yet, yet the Bible says that, that, that we each have gone our own way, done our own thing and kind of ran from God in that sense. And so in the gospel what we see is, is that God is purchasing us with, with the blood of his own son on the cross. That God is purchasing that thing which already belonged to him. It's this amazing picture. What we see in this story between Hosea and Gomer is this incredible love story this, that, that of Hosea's, ama- I mean, Hosea's reckless, scandalous love for Gomer where he pursues her, where he's faithful even when she's faithless, where, where he says, hey, I'm all in. And even though by all rights you already belong to me, I'm going to pay again. I'm going to purchase that which already belongs to me. And it's this amazing picture of God's love for us and that even though we are more broken than we could ever imagine his love is greater and he pursues us and he loves us and and he's faithful when we're not it's this amazing story the love of God let me pray for you you know I can't help but wonder if Gomer after she left And after she'd done a bunch of stuff, might have thought to herself at one moment, man, I'd love to go back to Hosea. But with all the stuff I've done, and I don't know that he could forgive me. And then I imagine her on that day when she was about to be auctioned off as a sex slave, and then she looks out And the first person to bid was Hosea. Saying that there's nothing too big for me to forgive. And then Hosea goes all in with everything he's got so that she could be set free. So that their relationship could be the way it was always supposed to be. And I wonder if some of you maybe have thoughts and feelings that maybe you feel like Gomer and maybe you think, you know what, 
Man, I'd love to think God could love me and that God could forgive me, but I've done stuff that I just can't shake, and I, I mean, I, I regret it, and I think it's too big for God to forgive, and I don't know. And, and what this story means is it means there's nothing too big for God to forgive. And that in the gospel, God went all in to purchase that which already rightfully belonged to him, me and you. But he said, I'm all in. And I wonder if maybe some of you today have never come to a spot in your life where you began a personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've done some church stuff. Maybe this is the first time you've ever been to church. Maybe you're somewhere in the middle. But you've never come to a spot where you recognized the reckless, scandalous love of God. And that because we've all done our own thing, because of my sin and your sin, we all find ourselves separated from God. But that even though we've been faithless, he's faithful, that he pursues. And that that's why Jesus came and died in my place and in your place, died for my sin and for your sin, taking the punishment I deserve and the punishment you deserve. But that he didn't stay dead, he rose from the dead conquering sin so that we could be forgiven and don't have to go through life with a bunch of guilt and shame and regret. Conquering death so that we don't have to fear it. Conquering hell so that we'd never have to go there. So that you could have the relationship with him that you were created to have. So that you could have eternal life. And maybe there's some people here this morning that have never come to a spot in your life where that's become real for you. You've never become a follower of Jesus. You say, well, man, how do I do it? The Bible says there's two things. First is to believe, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. To believe that he died on the cross for your sin. To believe that he rose from the dead. And really to believe he's your only hope. That you can't save yourself, that only he can save you. Other thing the Bible says is to repent. And really what that word means, it just literally just means a change of mind, a change of direction. It's really saying, God, I don't want to keep living life on my own terms, doing my own thing, going my own direction. But God, I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And maybe you're here, and you being here is a part of God pursuing you. And some of you, I believe, maybe right now, feeling like there's nothing I've ever heard that's felt more true than this. And if that's you, if you say, you know what, I've never given my life to Jesus, never become a follower of Jesus, it's never been real for me, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. You could pray something like it silently in your heart. Something like this. God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus to die in my place. And I believe he rose from the dead. And God, I don't want to keep living life on my own terms, going my own direction. But I want to follow Jesus the rest of my life. God, I want to give Jesus the steering wheel of my life, no longer my will, but yours. So God, even right now, would you come and live inside of me in the person of your Holy Spirit? So Father, Lord, we know that you see, uh, you don't just see the eyes, you see the hearts. God, I pray that that you take this uh, seed that's been planted And uh, God, that it would grow up and produce a great harvest. That these folks would love you and live for you for the rest of their lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.